Hello, and welcome to this edition of COVID Ethics Update, a center for practical bioethics service to our clients and subscribers across the country. Thank you for joining us today. My guest is Dr. Art Gertel. Art has been a collaborator with the center for at least the last few years, especially in the area of clinical trials and uh, pre-approval access of medications uh, for patients who are either in extreme need uh, through small group access or whether they're just involved in the development of new trials and drugs uh, for the diseases that they, they uh, experience in their lives. Art is going to be talking with us today about a topic that is of particular importance to him, and that is the uh, relaxation of standards of clinical trials, especially during a time of pandemic. So um, welcome, Art. Thank you for joining us today. I'm glad to have you. I would like for you to introduce yourself a little bit, give us a little bit more background about who you are, and um, then be able to launch into what you consider to be some serious ethical dimensions uh, related to the to development of new drugs and the completion of cl clinical trials for those patients currently involved. So welcome again. Sure. Thank you, John. Um, I've been involved in the clinical trial process for many decades now and uh, have both uh, conducted and served in various capacities in the clinical trial procedures and also studied and written on a number of challenges in uh, maintaining bioethical standards and patient protections for those who participate in clinical trials. So as we move through this very strange new world that we find ourselves in, I'd like to uh, talk about some of the challenges that we face from a very practical standpoint in maintaining conduct of clinical trials while preserving the protections that we have in place to ensure that patients who do volunteer uh, to in, be involved in investigational trials are protected both in terms of their physical safety and also their privacy and dignity. Um, one of the, the things that we find during the COVID-19 era is that patients are not going to be able to physically attend their site visits. And this presents a number of problems. It prevents challenges to compliance with uh, medications and procedures that the protocols require for these studies. It involves a inability to physically monitor these sites when the, uh, normally a pharmaceutical sponsor would deploy their clinical study monitors to the site to do uh, source document verification, this is no longer going to be feasible. And it also cascades into the area of informed consent. When you enroll a subject into a clinical trial, normally it is required that they have a signed physical document that attests to the fact that they have been well informed and understand the potential risks and benefits of study participation. They may not be able to obtain a physical document. So there are a number of challenges that we must consider uh, to ensure that the studies that do involve subjects who have life-threatening diseases for which there is no option in terms of existing standards of care, to be able to continue to take advantage of potentially uh, life-saving or condition-mitigating uh, interventions. So, so your work, uh, yeah. Art, have you, have you been able to kind of create a taxonomy or a hierarchy of, of kind of those standards that you see as not absolutely essential or less than necessary in order for us to be able to protect the, the, uh, the people that are enrolled in these trials? Well, I think there's always some give. I think there will always be, anytime you relax a standard, there is an increased potential for harm to the subjects or to the data integrity. And let's remember, it's not just the health and well-being of the subjects, although that is paramount, but also the integrity of the data and how uh, reliable it will be once it is submitted to the regulators to demonstrate that a product is safe and effective for the indication and the population for which it's expected to be marketed. So I think that there are certain uh, elements that the regulators have agreed are deserving of more flexibility given the challenges that we are facing. Uh, one is the timeliness of reporting. 
For example, if a as protocol deviation occurs or a violation occurs, normally the FDA will require a, a written report to the agency within a five-day period. They understand in recent guidance uh, that this may not always be feasible. It may not be possible to verify the, uh, the violation. It may not be possible to document it within an aggressive time frame that would normally be achievable. So they've said, we understand this. We are willing to accept a reasonable delay in conveying this information to us. Uh, in the case of informed consent, where normally there would be a physical document, they've now said that they are willing to consider a phone call to apprise the subject of the risks and potential benefits of the study. And that, that as long as that phone call is witnessed and attested to by a, a third party, that that will be acceptable. So they've understood that the physical documentation in many of these cases may not be uh, attainable, given the fact that people will not be able to attend a physical site. Uh, they've also okay, would, that, yeah. would that also then include uh, the recording of the the consent by the individual, or would it would it would it have to follow a different set of protocols where you would say no, it has to be witnessed, it has to be signed? How how, how much flexibility is there even in that process? Is it the, determined by the researcher, or is it determined by by the the regulators? It's determined ultimately by the regulators, but I think that this raises a very interesting point because the gatekeeper for a lot of these waivers, if you will, might well be the, uh, the IRB, the okay. Institutional Review Board. So they monitor and oversee on a study by study, and in some cases a site by site basis, what is acceptable. And so I think what it does is it argues for a much more intimate relationship between the investigator, the sponsor, and the IRB to ensure that when flexibility is warranted, that that flexibility is consistent, it's well understood, and that as much um, sort of stopgap measures as possible can be deployed. So if I were a researcher and I was having difficulty doing exactly what you're describing, and I called the IRB and I said, I need to have a special, I need special consideration here. I need special exemption. And, you know, it's kind of a fall on my sword and beg for your mercy kind of thing. What guidance does an IRB have in being able to respond to say, yeah, go ahead, that's not essential or that doesn't meet this particular marker? Are there, are there, is there guidance already out there for the IRBs? Well, there's guidance in the normal circumstances, which of course are, you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry is probably the most heavily regulated industry outside of nuclear power. So there are a lot of layers of protections that are applied in a normal circumstance. I don't think that there's been a formal um, guidance that has been issued with respect to IRB behavior. There has been guidance issued to guide site uh, personnel and pharmaceutical personnel in terms of the kinds of stringent monitoring requirements, recording and reporting requirements. Um, however, the IRBs, as far as I know, uh, have not received a specific guidance other than that which suggests that they be more hands-on and more involved. And, and the same is true for uh, data safety monitoring boards. Uh, DSMBs, are often an independent body of experts who are charged with the oversight of real-time data. So they are usually unblinded in a blinded study, data come over to them via an unblinded statistician, and they make real-time decisions as to whether or not a study could be continued as planned, needs to be modified, or whether it should be terminated or put on hold. So I think just as there needs to be a more robust real-time relationship between the IRB, the site, and the sponsor, I think the DSMBs can also play a very important role in ensuring that any 
flexibility that is applied to these studies does not unduly harm the participants. So is that the primary criteria? Tell, tell me what you think are the most important considerations in this kind of, I don't want to call it a dance, but it, it, it's certainly a much more intimate relationship, nuanced relationship between the IRB and the researchers and the, and the regulators, obviously, in this process. What, what, what advice and counsel do, would you give to, to principal investigators and then also to those that are reviewing their requests? Well, I think they have to look at potential consequences. And those potential consequences should be rank ordered in terms of the potential harm to the subjects, to the data, and to the ability to maintain a study that might otherwise be disrupted. You know, we, we don't always appreciate that these patients are really seeking, if not cure, at least reduction of symptoms of their disease. And if they are told that that study has been terminated or put on hold, they are put into a very desperate situation. Um, and, and the same is true in terms of um, prescribing unapproved medicines to patients who might, in the case of COVID-19, feel that they deserve any opportunity to forestall the effects of this disease. Uh, what that does, in effect, is deprives those patients who are prescribed this medication under, under the standard uh, label, so the approved indication, of potentially this, the drug that they need for their condition. So if you have lupus, you have other autoimmune diseases, and you've been prescribed uh, hydroxychloroquine, and you are unable to get access to that drug, you could suffer greatly because of that deficit. So that people who are obtaining this drug, using it off-label, physicians who are prescribing it off-label, unintentionally may harm those patients who are prescribed that drug under the existing approved label. Simply because of the, the lack of availability that's coming from the fact that it's being used for COVID-19, when that's not obviously the, the prescribed um, right. recommend for Indication. that particular yeah. population, but since it's off-label, it can be used for that, then poses problems in terms of accessibility for those who are currently involved in clinical trials related to a, a testing, a, a legitimate uh, investigation that's ongoing for the, of the, the experience of And so the investigational product supplies can be depleted uh, patients who are enrolled in studies may find that they don't have the access. Patients who are already being prescribed that product for autoimmune diseases, for example, right. may not have access. Now, a physician can prescribe a medication off-label if they feel it's medically legitimate. And you know the, the final determinant of that will be a court of law if there's litigation. Uh, however, uh, a lot of patients who are demanding uh, these drugs don't understand that they can cause harm in and of themselves. Uh, there are certain cardiac uh, conditions right. uh, that are increased in frequency uh, with the use of these drugs. And patients take these drugs because they have a condition for which, which would make their lives miserable or lead to uh, serious degradation in health if they don't have these medications. And, and desperate patients are going to be standing in line asking to be moved to the front of the line in front of those others. And I mean, that, that sounds like a, another hold oh, yeah. that's, update that, that we, <laughs> we might want to have you. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's at least a seminar. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, probably, yes. Yeah. So we've, we've got some webinars that we're doing uh, these days. Right. So maybe we should have you in for, for one of that. <laughs> Um, we're going to have to to wrap up here pretty quick. I want to uh, give you an opportunity to to make any uh, final comments that you have related to this, and I want to I want you to know how much I appreciate your spending some time with us today, Poe. So, if you've got any uh, any parting uh, advice or counsel for us in terms of uh, ethical considerations, uh, please share them. Well, I think this is a challenge of resources in many respects resources in terms of volume and resources in terms of access. 
And we need to look at the landscape as a gestalt and see where we can allocate personnel, supplies, medicines across the board, where we can borrow from one side to supply the other side in order to get the greatest value and maintain the greatest integrity of the research and the greatest integrity in terms of the protections of the patients. Okay. I want to thank you, Art, for being with us today for this edition of COVID Ethics Update. I want to remind my audience that um, we are doing this on a routine basis for the center on a regular basis, and these will be brought to you as, as soon as we have them ready to go. Uh, if you have questions or comments that you would like to share or topics that you'd like to bring to our attention, you can reach us at COVID at practicalbioethics.org. That's C-O-V-I-D. You can subscribe on our website by simply clicking on practicalbioethics.org and registering, as well as reg uh, subscribing to our YouTube uh, channel, which is at YouTube Practical Bioethics. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Art, for sharing you, John. with us today. And uh, we look forward to having you back on another edition. Thank you. Stay healthy.